It's good to see all of you this morning. As I mentioned um, last Sunday, um, this section um, that we're going to begin talking about this morning, Jesus is talking to his disciples about uh, humility and forgiveness. Um, now, I know none of us need um, any of this. Um, but uh, his disciples did. Um, and we're getting, this, this section actually covers a whole chapter in Matthew. It covers all of Matthew chapter 18. Um, we're probably only going to get down through about verse 6 this morning. Um, but I promise not to do like, you know, like Hugh has talked about before, where we only cover three words. I promise we will only cover three words this morning. Um, we will probably cover all six verses of, of Matthew, chap uh, Matthew chapter 18, the, the very first part of it. Um, but the disciples really, at this point, need need this lesson and I think probably a lot of us do too um, me included uh, so that's what we're going to look at this morning uh, the, the Jesus talking about humility and forgiveness uh, before we begin if you'll bow with me we'll begin with a prayer our dear loving Heavenly Father we're so thankful for the day we're thankful that it's the Lord's day we can come together and remember our Savior to proclaim uh, his death uh, to proclaim our faith that not only did he die for the sins of mankind but he was raised again uh, and he ascended on high where he reigns over your kingdom uh, and we're so thankful Father to be part of that kingdom to be part of your family because of him we are thankful for the forgiveness that you offered through his sacrifice Father that we did not have to uh, experience eternal separation from you uh, because he was willing to stand in our place. And we thank you so much, Father, and we beg for your forgiveness of our sins and for the strength and the willingness and the desire, Father, to walk more uprightly, uh, to walk more as he did, uh, sinless, Father. And we pray that you will strengthen us, that you will uh, build our faith so that we can uh, always see more clearly the ways that Satan will tempt us and, and, uh, and use things against us, Father, to try to lead us away from you. We pray, Father, that you will continue to be patient with us. You have suffered with us so long, Father, uh, but we're so, and we're so thankful and we pray for your continued patience your continued grace and mercy. For we know without those, Father, we will have no hope. We thank you for the opportunity to study this morning, for the word that you've made available, for the teachings of Jesus, and help us, Father, just as, as he taught the disciples. Help us to be more humble. Help us to be more forgiving. Help us to be uh, as he told them, uh, to be as little children, Father. Uh, in our dealings with, uh, with one another. We pray, Father, that your will will be done in all things and that your name will be glorified. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So, what led to this discussion that Jesus is going to have with his disciples about humility and forgiveness? I forgot to send out the readings, but we talked about it last Sunday morning, just very briefly at the end of, of class. Do you remember what happened that caused him to really kind of sit them down, so to speak, and have this discussion about humility with them? Right. There was a discussion about who was the greatest. Um, and so... You know, and, and this is where, again, it's, it's very important that we look at, at all three accounts to get the full picture. Um, you look there in Matthew chapter 18, um, and 
verse 1, it says, At that time the disciples came to Jesus saying, Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? So if all you read was Matthew's account, it would just appear that this was just a, they were just curious. They just had a question for Jesus. Who is greatest in the kingdom of heaven? But then if we go over to Mark chapter 9, Mark chapter 9, and let's begin in verse 33. It says, Then he came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, What was it you disputed among yourselves on the road? But they kept silent, for on the road they had disputed among themselves who would be the greatest. So this was more than just a, just curiosity. They had been arguing with one another, or disputing with one another, not about who in the kingdom was the greatest, but who among them was the greatest. Which of them? Which among the twelve was the greatest? And then we get, you know, the final piece of the puzzle over in Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9, uh, beginning in verse 46. Again, a dispute arose among them as to which of them would be the greatest. Which of them would be the greatest. Okay. So, now we have the full picture. Now we understand a little bit more why they needed a little bit of teaching about humility. And so, rather than immediately answering their question, what does Jesus do? He calls a little child to himself. And, and you, can, you can imagine this, or, or I can, um, that you know he calls this child over um, and, and I can see Jesus sitting this child up on his lap okay um, and, and now he's going to to teach them a lesson about humility and what he tells them really is kind of you know he, he's going to tell them who is the greatest in the kingdom but his answer is going to kind of be twofold. First of all, what he's going to tell them is the person who's greatest in the kingdom is the one who has the faith of a child. But the second thing he's going to tell them is that it's also going to be those who properly treat others who have the faith of a child. And we're going to talk about, we're going to kind of look at both of those uh, this morning. And the first, the first thing we want to look at is the one who is greatest in the kingdom is the one who has the faith of a child. Now, how does one develop the faith of a child? And Jesus tells us here. In fact, let's, before we, let's just, let's read. Matthew chapter 18. Let's begin in verse 2, because we've already read verse 1. And Jesus called the little child to him and set him in the midst of them. And he said, Assuredly, I say to you, unless you're converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever receives one little child like this in my name receives me. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were drowned in the depth of the sea. So, this is what Jesus says. And so, again, we we'll go back to developing the faith of a child. What's the first thing that Jesus said they were going to have to do to develop the faith of a child? Oh, okay. A little bit before that. Change. Change or be converted. And I don't know if y'all remember this, but I, I kind of left you with a question at the end of class last Sunday where Jesus told, be converted. You have to be converted. And so the question I asked was, 
what does Jesus mean by that? Um, if, you know, because how do we normally use the word conversion? Christ. You have to come to Christ, to obey the gospel. You know, that's that's how how we normally think of conversion. Um, but then uh, at the at after class um, uh, last Sunday, a uh, bill came up and he said his version instead of the word converted uses a different word. And you remember what that word is, Bill? Huh? Change, 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 turn. Okay. So, what does Jesus mean then? When he says they have to be converted, change their change their thing. My ear understand and change. Say that again, Betsy. Hear, understand, and change. Hear, understand, and change. Okay. They have to admit they were wrong. They have to admit they were wrong. And who do you have to kick to the curb? In order to admit that you're wrong, yourself. yourself. The other eleven. <laughs> the other eleven. <laughs> That's the conversion that Jesus is talking about here. Is a change of mind, but more specifically, a change of mind about me. If I'm going to become like a little child, I need to change my mind about me. Because when I do that, is me more important than anybody else? No. And I want you to think about just a little child. And, and now, um, you kind of have to think of a child in, in this, what I'm about to say, in a controlled environment. Okay. No, no, no. No, not, not one that's been taught necessarily, but just the... Uh, Right, right. A, a, a ch just a, a pure, innocent child who has not been taught any preconceived ideas. Does a child? Does that child think of himself or herself as better than anybody else? No, absolutely not. Um, now, do they want their needs met? Of course. You know, uh, from a baby. You know, how do we tell mom we're hungry? Well, we cry, we draw attention to ourselves. But that doesn't necessarily mean that we're, we think we're better. Maybe we just have needs. Okay? So a, a child doesn't think better of himself. And a child doesn't look at things with preconceived ideas. A child in its, you know, in its purest state, I guess is what I'm trying to say. And so that is what Jesus is trying to tell his disciples, is that if you want to be the greatest in the kingdom, you are going to, first of all, have to change your mind about you and realize it's not about you. It's really about other people. Um, and so that's, first of all, how they were to... They were, so they, they had to be converted... Okay. Secondly, and I've kind of used this word or these words, just kind of tossed them in there. What else do you think of when you think of a, of a child? Uh, and we're going to get to humility in a minute, but there's some other things that we think about when we think about children. Think in, about innocence. innocence or purity. Okay. So that's the second thing. Basically, Jesus doesn't necessarily um, uh, come out and say this directly, but the fact that he brought a child to himself implies that there's got to be some innocence and purity in order to develop the faith of a child. Uh, you know, because you think about virtually every sin that you can think of is about me. And it really comes from a lack of humility or a lack of a lack of innocence, a lack of purity. Um, you, you, you think about what John said in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 16, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. All of those are about me. The lust of the flesh is what I want. Right. 
to gratify me. The lust of the eye is what I want to look at because it pleases me. And the pride of life is what I want to do because I want to make sure I'm looking out for number one. I'm looking out for me. But is a child like that? You know, a, a, a child, again, a child is going to want their needs met. But it's not because of a lack of humility or a lack of purity. I want you to notice what um, the Apostle Paul says over in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 20. He says, Brethren, do not be children in understanding. However, in malice be babes, but in understanding be pure. What is malice? What's that? Evil. Okay. Um, wanting to do something bad to someone else. Doing it with evil intent, okay? Um, because they hurt my feelings or they did something bad to me, okay? But what Paul says is when it comes to things like that, and I think we can broaden it, when it comes to sin, be babes, be children, and our children. Children are innocent. Children are pure. Children are humble. Now, are children perfect? I can, I can vouch that they are not. Okay? But I want you to think about how a child reacts. And again, we're talking about a child, a young child. How a child reacts when they've done wrong. And they're confronted with having done wrong. Again, this is not true for everything, but generally. How do they react? Is it before or after? Before. Either one. Okay. Usually they, they I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Mama. Or I'm sorry, Daddy, that I did that. And, you know, some, a lot of times they'll, they'll cry, they'll get emotional because you know, number one, they know they're, they've done wrong. But number two, they know that they've disappointed their parents. Okay. And what they're, what they're going to do, usually, is they're going to try to do better to please mom and daddy. Because they know that what they did was wrong. So can you make the connection to what Jesus is talking about here? How should we react to sin? We should acknowledge that wrong. We should, like a little child, sincerely say you're sorry and do better to not disappoint our Father in the future. So, so faith of a child is conversion, changing our minds about ourselves, be developing more innocence and purity towards sin. And then the last one is the one that's already been brought out is humility. Matthew, go back to Matthew chapter 18 and verse 4. Whoever humbles himself as this little child is the greatest. You know, part of all of this, two things. Uh, my experience of going to China where they have the one child policy. Most of the children were spoiled brats. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think depending on which society we're talking about mm -hmm. and today our child raising skills on a whole are not really good. Mm -hmm. uh, we may have been over corrective with punishment a hundred years ago, 
But what I don't really know, what was it like <coughs> in Corinth, mm -hmm. raising a child? Right. But the second observation I made, not knowing any of that, mm -hmm. take a child in a group of adults that he is not familiar with, and he will be humble yes. because he doesn't know and he's willing to be told. Yes. And anybody in the group mm -hmm. could correct for that. Yes. And that, that's what I see here. Jesus, in the middle of a group of adults, mm -hmm. takes a child. Mm -hmm. And that's a whole different scenario than two children playing out in the sandbox. True. True. And, and that's a that's a good point, you know, that taking it in the context of what Jesus is talking about here. Um, you know, in, in the not in the environmental context of, of what Jesus is doing. That's a that's I think very I mean that's a very good way to look at it. Yes, ma'am. Well, I think that I can kind of tell you what it was like a little bit during that, that time. Mm -hmm. um, not necessarily with the Jews, but with the Gentiles, mm -hmm. children were at the very, very bottom yes. of, of the room. Mm -hmm. And in fact, um, there is a, a writing that they uncovered from about this time where a husband was writing to his wife, well, if it's a boy, we'll keep it. If it's a girl, just leave it out mm -hmm. and let it die. Mm -hmm. they, they pretty much you know, didn't consider children the way even mm -hmm. the Jewish parents would. They would have looked at it like, well, it's probably going to die anyway. Mm -hmm. And so they were really the lowest of the low. Yeah. So when he talks about being humble like like children, mm -hmm. they would have been, whoa, we are supposed to be really down at the bottom of the rung. Mm -hmm. so, and um, that really not that really takes them down a few notches when you put it into that perspective. You know, again, when Jesus says, if you want to be greatest, this is where you have to be. So that's that's a, a good point. Um, you know, again, and, and I think kind of part of the way I look at this also is kind of um, through, I don't know, kind of look at it the way we look at the Proverbs. You know, because, you know, while what Solomon said, generally is true. You know, train up a child in the way he should go, and these old people will not depart from it. Generally, that's true. But it ain't always true. Okay. Um, and, and so I think uh, also part, and I think I think you both um, really, have, you, you've given me a lot of food for thought. Um, but also, you know, just think, uh, the typical perception of a child is purity, it's innocence, it's humility when we think about children. Um, and, and it's it's you know not necessarily thinking of themselves as as better uh, than others. And again, that's before you know sometimes we get a hold of them and teach them maybe some preconceived ideas that they don't need to have. You know, because you think about a child. A child has no preconceived ideas necessarily about himself or others. And by that, I'm talking about, you know, whether it's, it's race, whether it's um, social class, uh, whether it's um, education. You know, we teach kids those, those, a lot of times those biases, don't we? Because, you know, you, you're going to, out on the playground, <laughs> Kids are gonna, they're gonna play with whatever comes along. Generally, until we get a hold of them, they don't know how to play with them. They come from the other side of the tracks. Or our people don't mix with their people. You know? But a child in and of itself does not have those kinds of preconceived ideas. Uh, and so this is part of the humility, I think, uh, and, and Jesus. But also, does a child have any preconceived ideas about what they will or will not do to help other people? I sure didn't. 
you know, when my, when my dad, when I was a kid and my dad said, come outside, I need you to help me. I can guarantee you the first words out of my mouth were not, well, what do you need me to do? <laughs> it was, okay, because I wanted to be with dad and I wanted to please dad. And, and there was, I mean, there was nothing I, I would or would not do to help. And kids are like that. They don't ask, oh, well, it depends on what you want. It depends on what you need. And so I think that's also part of what Jesus is talking about here when he talks about the humility of children. It's interesting to me there's so much junk on Facebook. But there are posts where children see a situation and immediately go try to help. Mm -hmm. uh, one that I found interesting was a statue of a little boy that was falling out of a wheelchair. Mm -hmm. I said statue. Mm -hmm. But the kid coming along, four or five years old, saw that and immediately walked over and was trying to help mm -hmm. back up. Yeah. And that's they see the need and mm -hmm. right. And, and I think that kind of really segs into the next section of what Jesus is going to say because he goes from talking about, okay, this is the kind of faith you need to have. And then he, but then he switches gears. He said, but this is how you need to treat people who have that kind of faith. Okay? So that's where we get into um, this discussion of how we treat people that have the faith of a child. Okay, And again, let's go back to Matthew chapter 18. Um, and it really it picks up in verse 5. He says, Whoever receives one little child like this in my name receives me. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin... It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were drowned in the depth of the sea. So, what does Jesus say for when we meet someone who has this kind of faith? What are we supposed to do? Teach them. Not teach them. He says receive them. Receive such a one who has this kind of faith. Now, what does that imply about faith? If we're supposed to receive such a one who has this kind of faith, what does that have to necessarily imply about faith? I like the word accept. Okay. Uh, it's a little broader shade of meaning. Mm -hmm. uh, not just receive reluctantly. Or right. Something, right. But to accept them as one of ours, one mm -hmm. equal to me or better than me. Right. So what that implies then, and, and Hugh just said it without saying it, <laughs> is that it implies we have the same kind of thing. Because remember, what we just talked about, the humility of a child, you, a, a, a child is not going to have any preconceived ideas about who he, you know, how he will and will not help. So if I'm to accept this person who has this childlike faith, that necessarily implies that I have the same kind of faith because I'm not going to make any preconceived, I'm not going to have any preconceived ideas about this person coming in. I'm going to say, oh, you have the same faith I do. Welcome. You're now one of us. Yes, ma'am. Well, I remember, too, who he's talking to. Yes. These would be the ones that really had a lot of knowledge mm -hmm. about the faith. Mm -hmm. And I know that even among us, we have probably met people who were very learned. I mean, mm -hmm. they've got, you know, a lot of background in not just the faith, but in other secular works and things like that. Mm -hmm. And it almost seems like they only want to talk to those people who are at that same level of faith. And these other people are just not that important to them. 
And I think that he's talking to them saying, don't be like that. Right. Because those little ones are the ones that are important to me. Mm -hmm. So right. that would be my thinking on that too. Very good. And so, um, and I think you, you kind of, you did say this a minute ago, is that we, when we accept them, we accept them as equals. Or actually we accept them as better than us. Yes, sir. You know, we're having this conversation, and I'm thinking, like, Little Radar Evie, when we take her and her little sister to the park, well, unless she wants to know if her friends are going to be there, and one might think that she's talking about specific friends that she has, uh -huh. that girl will go out on the playground and stand in front of anybody out there mm -hmm. and say, I'm Evie, mm -hmm. will you play with me? Mm -hmm. I don't care if they're five years older than she is or two mm -hmm. years younger, and if they turn away, she'll look in front of them again, mm -hmm. and she'll keep asking until they play. Mm -hmm. And I'm often refreshed by that because adults, you know, we get in Turkish moods and well, I don't know if I can talk to that person or that person. And this is really so bold. Mm -hmm. And it just reminds me of children the way Jesus talks about children. Right. How innocent they are, no preconceived notions. And she doesn't care if they are brown or black or white or purple or it's a friend. It's a friend. And I would almost guarantee, without you saying it, that 10 minutes later, that child will be her best friend. <laughs> yes. So, yeah, that's just, that's the way children are. And that's what Jesus is saying. It's how Jesus is saying we need to be when it comes to those who share the same faith. But I've uh, tried to interpret, understand this. I think what he did in verse 5 when he used the word child, mm -hmm. was not really referring to the child on his lap, but was referring to the one that has been converted and become as a child. Yes. The other adult yes. disciples. Mm -hmm. And so that changes from verse 5 and following. Yes. To our relationship mm -hmm. as brethren. Yes. Together. And, and I agree. I really, I, I think, you know, Jesus used the child as an example. But when he starts talking about the faith and how we treat one another, he's talking about those of us who have been converted, those who have the faith of a child, um, and, and how we, what our relationships are with one another. Bill? I think it's referring to uh, those that have just been baptized into Christ. They're, they're, they're as a child, they don't know very much of anything. And he's telling, actually he's giving us a sense of nourishing. Mm -hmm. Take them in your, in your heart room, judge them or whatever, but teach them, teach them more. And, and I don't disagree uh, uh, at all with what Bill said. Uh, you know, I, I believe there is a a very good application for how we treat those who have been newly converted. Um, if we don't treat them any differently as, you know, oh, brother so-and-so who's, you know, been a Christian for 50 years and, and can quote the whole New Testament, you know, verbatim uh, without opening the book and all of that. But I would go a step further to say that there is a broader application. What Jesus, I think what Jesus is saying is that this is the type of, of attitude that we need, all need to maintain lifelong is this childlike faith um, that doesn't make, you know, doesn't make assumptions about people that, you know, that, that always treats others with humility. Um, and, and so Jesus says we are to accept those who have this, this faith. And, and so then he takes it a step further because he says, when you do that, what else are we doing? Who else are we accepting? He says, when you do this, you're accepting me. Okay. okay, somebody explain that. How is it that when we accept someone with this faith, this childlike faith, how is it that we are accepting Jesus as well? Well, you have to go, you have to look at, you know, what Jesus' mission and message was. Jesus' mission and message was all about 
servanthood and submission. Um, you know, there, there are several passages we could look at, you know, Matthew 25, John 13, Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ. And then it shows how Jesus' whole mission was one about lowering himself and humbling himself. And how far was he willing to go to humble himself, even to the point of death on the cross? And so to receive and serve someone and to be humble in our service to those who share the same faith, really Jesus is saying, when you do that, you understand what I'm all about. You understand what my mission was. That it's not about you lording it over someone else. But it's about you serving as many people as you can and humbly doing it. Not for the, not for the, because did Jesus do what he did for praise? No. He did it to fulfill the Father's will. And so we have to have the same attitude of humility, not for the praise of men, but to fulfill the Father's will. Particularly, Jeff, that. Verse 6 is just, it devastates me when I read that and think back. Because I've been in several situations, preaching, holding meetings, in churches that were fighting. Mm -hmm. And the way that they spoke of each other, the way they treated each other, the rejection of each other, uh, and I don't think they took verse 6 very seriously. Yeah. Because that. to treat each other that way, mm -hmm. uh, we will be treated the same way. Yes. In judgment. Right. But, and, and so, and, and Hugh's absolutely right. We're going to talk about, we're going to go ahead and talk about verse 6. And I'm just going to read it again. Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were drowned in the depth of the sea. Quick review here. How do we nurture those that share the same faith that we do? We accept them, we serve them, and thirdly, and I think probably most importantly, we don't call them to stumble. And Jesus is going to talk more about stumbling blocks in, in the next section. But don't cause them to stumble. Now remember the context. What started all of this? Who's greatest? Selfishness. Okay. How can we cause someone to stumble based on the context of what we're talking about here? Well, if I'm in the church and I'm selfish and I'm always trying to get my way, what is that going to teach other people? To be selfish as well. It's going to set the example for them. And is selfishness a sin? Yeah. And so I can cause someone to stumble by trying to make myself the greatest, by pursuing my own selfish ambitions within the church. It doesn't even have to be in the church. I mean, in our everyday lives, if I'm out there being cutthroat, trying to get all I can get, but then I'm an angel on Sunday, I guarantee you, how I live my life the rest of it, it doesn't happen in the back when people are you know. And that's going to put us down the block before people if I'm being selfish. Again, how is one going to achieve greater status in the kingdom? 
childlike humility, and putting the needs of others first. That's how we become the greatest. Not by stepping over everybody else to get what we want. And what does Jesus say is the outcome of those who make others stumble through selfish ambition? It would be better for them to have a millstone tied around their neck and thrown. You just as well kill yourself. Mm -hmm. Also, somewhere in there says that they're getting their reward. They are getting that they have their reward. So there really there's a contrast here. Simple good. Whether it's the great thing of casting out a demon, or it's the little thing, and we're going to talk about this in the next section, of giving someone a drink of water. There's a great reward. No matter how great we make it, the reward is great. But making others stumble, there's great punishment. There's great consequences for making others stumble. So, we didn't get as far as I expected this morning. But we did get through verse 6, <laughs> which is where I said we, we would get. Um, what we want to talk about next is actually um, not in Matthew. Matthew doesn't cover it, and I've got like two minutes, and then I'll quit. But Mark and Luke both cover this, and so it's, it's kind of right in, in, in Matthew 18. You know, Jesus talks about you know, putting the stumbling block in front of others um, in, uh, in verse 6. Um, and then in verse 7, it, all, it, it immediately goes to, you know, woe wo to the world because of offenses. It talks about stumbling block, more about stumbling blocks. But kind of in, in the in-between here, we see John. And John was jealous. Um, you know, we, talk, we think about Peter being impetuous, and then we talk about, you know, James and John are called the sons of thunder because they... You know, we assume because they had kind of an anger problem. And, and, uh, that, and this is one of the things that kind of made John jealous or, or John's, uh, John angry. But John's concern here, and I'm just going to introduce this before we get to it on Wednesday. John's concern, or what called, made him jealous, is that there was someone who was casting out demons in Jesus' name. But John says, but you're not one of those. So, we're going to talk about what they did. And in fact, let's, let's just, I'm just going to introduce this by going over to Mark chapter 9 and verse 38. So John answered him, this was after Jesus said that about whoever receives one of these little children, receives me, and who, he who receives not me, but him who sent me. John answered him and said, saying, Teacher, we saw someone who does not follow us casting out demons in your name, and we forbade him because he does not follow us. That's where we're going to pick up things. It's talking about what John said and how Jesus answered. Um, and so that is that's where we'll we'll pick up uh, Lord willing on Wednesday. So thank you all very much for your attention this morning and your participation. Most of all for your participation. Very good discussion. <laughs>